Thank you all for joining us again today. We are so excited to hear about your diverse experiences within the industry and what you have accomplished throughout your time. So to start off, we know you all have some amazing achievements within the industry, um, but back in college, when you were all in college, what was that original career goal, life goal that you were hoping to achieve and how has that kind of changed to where you are at now? Would you like to start? <laughs> yeah, sure, I can definitely start. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kathy. I actually am a recent graduate from SDSU. So I recent graduate and also kind of like Amanda, I was a swimmer as well uh, for SDSU. So uh, pretty recent into the, the whole postgraduate life. But going into college, I definitely knew I wanted to serve others. And I wanted to have a profession that served others. So I was looking along the lines of like teen life coaching, mental health counselor, things like that. Um, and now currently I am a program facilitator and coordinator at Girls Inc, which is a nonprofit. Um, so I'm definitely still along the lines of mentoring um, and working with youth and serving others. Absolutely, and Angela, would you like to continue on? Sure, um, I'm actually fortunate enough to be doing what I set out to be doing in college. Um, I started working in sports with the men's basketball team here at San Diego State in 1998, so before Coach Fisher and Dutcher. Um, and my whole goal was to be able to use, um, to navigate athletes platform for good, for social change, and, um, and also to help women along the way. So I'm fortunate enough to be the, the owner of an all-female sport management firm doing just that, working with professional athletes using their, their platform for responsible change. Uh, we should have gone age before beauty, I think, here. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, um, obviously, the oldest one on the panel and has started a long time ago. So the goals back in the day were to teach physical education and hopefully get to coach, a, get to coach somewhere along the way. And I was fortunate in college that I was able to um, land a coaching job right, um, right out of college. and. Uh, it, it paid me about $5,000 a year, uh, so it didn't get me very far, but at the time um, I was able to make it and, and it, it, one thing led to another and 40 years later, I'm reti finally retiring from coaching. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Audra Dent and I started at San Diego State um, just knowing that I always wanted to work with kids and try to help in any way that I could and I've definitely been able to do that in two different careers. So I do coach volleyball. Um, I've coached for about 18 years now. And I also work in special ed as a consultant. And so I've really kind of been lucky enough to be able to follow both of those paths and just make it work on the day to day. Absolutely, thank you all for sharing. Um, inevitably working in athletics or even playing a sport as a collegiate athlete or growing up, there is a lot of opportunity where you may face defeat or feeling like you have failed in an aspect. Can you kind of explain an experience where you have gone through that and how you navigate um, that defeat throughout life? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like being an athlete and even just, you know, specifically in swimming as well, because that's my experience, I, failure is very common. It's, it's an individual sport and it's just something that you personally have to go through by yourself as well, not necessarily with your team. So I personally was swimming um, internationally. My family is from Panama, so I swam internationally for Panama. And in 2016, I had the opportunity to qualify for the Olympics representing Panama. And it was the meet right before um, my trials. It was, it was my trial meet and I missed the cut by half a second. And it was just, it was devastating because as a swimmer, as an athlete, I you know trained my whole life for that up until that point. Um, that was my goal, that was my dream. So that was difficult. That was definitely a moment of failure for me. Um, but amazingly enough, like, you know, I got through it kind of with the, the resources that I had at the moment, but now coming forward to 2020, uh, I had the opportunity to actually qualify for the Olympics in 2020 representing Panama. Uh, 2020, COVID happened as we all know. Uh, so I wasn't able to go. Uh, but then 2021, Panama asked me to requalify. And I wasn't able to attend a swim meet in order to requalify because of COVID. Uh, so I wasn't able to attend. So that was, those two big moments for me were huge moments as you can call it failure, but the way I had seen it was just moments of redirection in a way. Um, I usually, I, at the moment, you know, it's hard because you're, you've, you've 
worked so hard to get to this point. Um, but at the moment, I think what I really did was I focused on, okay, acknowledging that, you know, how I felt and just, you know, the fact that, okay, this is not what I expected. And then, you know, letting it out normally in the forms of crying or <laughs> screaming. Um, and then just, like I said, redirecting that and moving forward. So I think that was the biggest lesson I learned with failure is like not dwelling in it, not holding it with you, but um, just moving forward and moving past it. I think the redirection is beautiful. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful way to capture it. Um, my career I've spent just fighting the patriarchy, you know, nothing against men, but they've made my career pretty difficult, my path, and I failed for years, especially trying to start my own business. And the one thing um, I did was I never wavered from where I knew I was gonna end up. And then secondly, I surrounded myself with people who believed in that as well. Sometimes that team was very small, it was just my family. Um, and then it began to grow into some other colleagues who really put everything into what they saw the dream and now I've kept those people close. You know, if I'm eating, they're eating. And I think it was important to just never give up and it sounds so cliche, but just to really believe in where you're gonna go. Um, I, I have to tell a story because this sort of um, took me through my life, but I was 20 years old at a national championship and um, was pitching and um, our team lost the game because I walked in the winning run. And uh, I, it was night game, I went off to the side at the bleachers and I was sitting down, crying, changing my shoes, going about my business, feeling terribly sorry for myself. And a little girl walked over and said, could I please have your autograph? And that just, that just shook me to my core and made me realize that there's a lot more to life than this game. And there's so much uh, influence that we can have and that little girl didn't care that I walked in the winning run and it, and it didn't matter. And that, that's just a story that's kind of kept me going, good, bad, or ugly. There's a reason for everything. And that day she was the reason. Um, similar to some of the other panelists, I um, had dreams of playing overseas in Europe after graduating from state. And I went over on a tour for a couple of weeks where you kind of go in the middle of the season and you're hoped to get picked up by one of these international teams. And I had again trained, you know, my entire life for this moment and I had my big suitcase packed up and, you know, my time to come home was going to be maybe never. I could have, you know, lived in Europe for years and years. Um, but I, I experienced a pretty severe shoulder injury when I was there. So um, I, you know, was in shape and I felt so prepared, but in volleyball, if you can't put the ball down, then um, you're not going to get picked up for a team. So mm -hmm. I uh, was in a lot of pain when I was there. And it was not just physical, but it was really emotional because I was like, well, what am I going to do? You know, this was my plan. And as an athlete, we have our plans and we have our goals and that's what we're going to do. And so um, once I got back on the plane to come back home a couple weeks later and get surgery and then start the long process of rehab, um, you know, I had to kind of go back and figure out what do I want to do? You know, do I want to try again and go back to Europe and, and maybe pursue that professional career? Or do I want to stay here and figure out what I can do in California? And so it brought me back to San Diego. I had moved home. And because of that, you know, I've had a, a long coaching career and also been able to pursue my passion in helping students with um, different abilities. And I'm very, very grateful for that moment because if I wouldn't have um, come home, who knows, you know, if I would be as fulfilled as I, as I currently am. So again, I think uh, considering it more of a redirection than an absolute failure um, was something that I was able to do. And like Amanda was talking about, I just am so grateful for my, my support system that allowed me to stay up and stay positive and stay uh, focused on, on continuing um, to pursue my dream. Absolutely, thank you all for sharing those stories of redirection and how that's kind of helped you to get to where you are today. Um, as we saw in our fabulous keynote, we had a lot of kind of questions for advice for the future. We have a very diverse group of attendees ranging um, from different grade levels here at SDSU. What is one piece of advice that you would give to your college freshman year self and then maybe your graduating self as well? Yeah, my freshman year, I was a very ambitious person. I really thought that I could be a part of every organization possible. Um, 
So I definitely really dabbled in a lot of different things freshman year. I think one piece of advice I would really give to myself is it's okay, of course, to try out different things, to try out a lot of things. But then once you find the things that really are you're passionate about, like Amanda was speaking about, or even just the things that really like kind of set your heart on fire or get you really excited, focus on those things instead. Um, so for example, for me, freshman year, I was part of multiple organizations, but I didn't, I didn't put my 100% in all of those organizations. So one thing I do wish I did was I, that I stuck to one or two and really put all of my effort and all of my attention into those and then build, kind of like build up my leadership skills within those organizations as well. I would tell my college self to trust yourself. If I can entertain a quick story real quick, um, over COVID, you know, we were all doing Zoom meetings and we, um, we were invited to a meeting with a pretty, pretty impressive CMO for a really, 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 really big international brand who wanted to get involved in some of our programming. And I had a colleague of mine on the Zoom with me and so it was just the three of us and he was asking me questions and I was explaining the program which was around the digital divide and he would ask the question a different way and so I would explain it a different way. And this went back and forth a few times and so I finally texted my, my teammate and I said am I not explaining this right like what is what is where's the disconnect because it's it was pretty clear to me and she said no you're explaining it right I just don't think he's getting it and it was like my professional career flashed before my eyes I had spent so many years doubting myself and assuming I was the one in the room who didn't understand and assuming that everyone who was speaking was smarter than me or knew better than me even though there were times I'm like how oh, that doesn't seem right and my gut was saying otherwise. So I would have saved myself years of just stress and trauma and angst, you know that feeling, when I should have just been listening to my gut the whole time. That doesn't mean I needed to be cocky, you know, be humble, but trust yourself. And I just, it was, it was just the biggest epiphany. And that just happened last year when I was 40 years old. So <laughs> there's always time to learn. <laughs> Good for you. Um, if I, had to speak to my freshman self, I think I would just say, um, stay the course, because mm -hmm. I, I went in to the school that I went to um, as a very green, innocent, sweet, um, hardworking young lady, and I, and I think um, if I would just stay that course, which most of, most of the time I did, but um, that would have, I think that has gotten me to where I am today, and, I, and I'm very pleased with that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, for my freshman self or even graduating, I just think that being present is so important. Mm -hmm. And like even just walking, you know, on campus today, it's like there's flashbacks and I remember aspects of it, but mm -hmm. it, it really just kind of feels like a blur. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think just being present and really trying to like live in the moment, um, you know, as silly as it may sound, is really, really important because these times are times that you can't get back, you know. Being in college, whether you're an athlete or not, um, being you know a student is something that a lot of people you know don't get the opportunity ever, let alone um, at somewhere so amazing as San Diego State. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just really being present and just really being you know grateful and practicing that gratitude of like what you're able to to do every single day, and even on the hard days, just remembering like I'm still lucky and I'm still fortunate to be here and just you know, take pictures and remember all the fun memories with, with your people and because um, it goes by fast. And then when you get out of college, it goes by even faster. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, just presence. All right, we're gonna transition over just a little bit. So 2022 is actually the 50th anniversary of Title IX. What does Title IX mean to you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was actually reading a, a like kind of a paper the other day and it said that before Title IX, there was one in 27 girls in high school that participated in sports. And then after Title IX, it actually became one in five girls in high school that participated in sports, uh, which I find to be mind-blowingly amazing. Um, I, what, the way I see Title IX too is not just a way for it to give opportunity and equal access to sports to girls, but also in a way to have girls be able to get that added benefit of what sports even means. Right, so me being an athlete, I've been an athlete for my entire life now. And I have just been able to benefit from, you know, the, through the sports and through swimming, I've been able to benefit not only having, you know, the health, act, the, the, excuse me, the health benefits, 
or the mental health benefits, but also just the lessons learned through sports. Um, just like the lessons about failures that we've been talking about, just the lessons on leadership, the lessons on teamwork. Um, sports now has been able to you know, give girls the opportunity to have that, that, have that chance to get those benefits and get those added benefits. And I think that's like what's really empowering about Title IX is now we have the opportunity to become leaders in our own lives, but through sports and having that opportunity to like become equal, again, get that equal access as well, so. Yeah. Yeah. And when I was younger, um, just, I, I think it was, it meant, what it meant to me is that my little younger girl self never had to even question what I would be able to do. It was mm -hmm. just, a given, even though that women before us fought so, so hard. Um, and I grew up with a male champion. My father was a huge advocate for women in sports. He coached the very first girl in Little League in San Diego when no one coach wanted her on the team. He made sure he recruited her and made sure, you know, the, the, the boys didn't bully her or anything like that. And so we grew up understanding that we were capable of anything. And so the Title IX access was just an opportunity to give little girls their all the dreams they want. Yeah. I probably have a very different perspective of Title IX than, than some others in the room. And, um, and you know, it, it, it's interesting to me that a law that was created 50 years ago that we're celebrating now, we're still so far out of whack. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to sound ungrateful because I think it's, I wouldn't have had 40 years of coaching. Um, a $5,000 a year job that I told you about is now up to an 80,000 or a hundred thousand $100,000 a year job. Um, there are, amazing opportunities for women because like you said so many women fought for us and fought to give us the opportunities that we have fought to give women the opportunity to go to college mm -hmm. to, and sit in the seats that you all are in right now um it's a it's but it's a double-edged sword in my opinion because i i see the other side of it as well and i see that we're not there yet so you know please keep fighting um, and I think it's a little bit more comfortable to fight for it now than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I will tell you that it's an exhausting fight, but you're young and you have all kinds of energy and you can continue <laughs> that fight and it's appreciated. Yeah. Um, and it, it's why we're here today. Uh, I, but one, you know, one place I really want us to keep fighting for in athletics is we see, we see so many men coaching women's teams and we do not even consider women coaching men's teams. And I think that's a travesty. And I think you see the occasional one in the news right now, just the mm -hmm. fact that we have to put it on the news is a hello it was a red flag. It, it, you know, if you're a man in this room, recruit women to coach those sports. If you're, um, if you're considering, you know, a applying for jobs, throw your name in there. You have nothing to lose. Um, we need more women's influence on those young men because we have a very important perspective to bring to them. And I think that that is something where we really continue to lack. Um, but God bless Title IX and those who brought it into, into, into existence. And, you know, yes, we have benefited greatly from it. Um, yeah, for me, Title IX means everything. Like if, if Title IX wouldn't have been um, created, I would have had a much, much harder life. I think because of Title IX, I was able to get a scholarship and, and play volleyball and go to, go to college, you know. Um, I came from pretty humble beginnings, so there wasn't, you know, a college fund waiting for me once I graduate where I get to just choose where to go. I had to work really, really hard. And um, because of Title IX, it opened up so many opportunities for me. And now as a coach, um, you know, those same opportunities are extended to, to the players and the athletes that, that I'm able to influence. And I think that um, what, you know, Kathy just said is so, so true in terms of the men and female coach divide. Um, I had phenomenal male coaches here at San Diego State, but it's not always the case. And I think that having as many women lead both women and men, it's, it's just so incredibly important. Um, I, have a, I have a three and a half year old son and he is, you know, he's amazing and brilliant and all the things, but it's so funny, even in his little mind, 
he's convinced I coach a football team. <laughs> and he's like, are you going to coach your football team? And I'm like, no, babe, like it's a volleyball team and they're girls and girls play sports too. And girls could play football if they wanted also, but not every sport is football. So <laughs> I think Title IX has really kind of opened that up um, and at least given access to more athletes and given access to more women. Um, and hopefully soon he'll shift his mindset and understand that it's not all about football. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, to me, Title IX is everything. It's my life, it's my career, and it's um, you know a huge influence on my family as well. Absolutely, thank you for sharing those uh, meaningful aspects of Title IX for you all. Now we have some individual questions kind of based off of what you're up to now um, in the industry. So Kathy, you've written a book, Beyond Her Vision, and you're planning to publish it by the end of this year. Can you tell us a little bit about the story and um, what inspired you to write it? Yeah, definitely. So in the work that I do now currently with Girls Inc., I've noticed that a lot of the girls, they have a lot of struggle in terms of, you know, finding that, finding their voice and finding the confidence in themselves to, you know, go after their dreams, do the things that they want to do in life. And it was really bugging me. I was really noticing a lot of other challenges that girls were facing within my organization. And it kind of got me thinking about what other challenges girls are facing you know, across the nation. I mean, I work specifically with uh, a demographic of girls who are low income, uh, first generation students, and you know, who predominantly come from an immigrant household. So I knew that you know, there's obviously a lot of other girls in America, of course, but I was curious to know what other girl focused nonprofits are doing now today to help those girls and the challenges that they're facing and also what they're doing to progress towards gender equality. So that's kind of what the book is, in, is about. Um, I'm currently still writing it, but it is supposed to be published by the end of this year. Uh, but yeah, I'm very excited about it. Absolutely, and then SDSU currently provides student athletes with a comprehensive four-year development plan kind of centered around three pillars of personal growth, career development, as well as civic engagement. It's called Aztecs Going Pro. Can you talk about how this program specifically helps you prepare to transition um, after your sport and after SDSU? Yeah, I would say being a student athlete, uh, we don't usually think a lot about what comes after being a student athlete. It's very, we're very narrowed down into what our life is, either being a student or the athlete part of it. Uh, what I really appreciate about Aztecs going pro was that it kind of, it brought us to that, right? It, it didn't just bring us to, okay, we get it, like you're a student athlete right now, but like, what about after? What about, you know, your future goals? What about your future dreams? Um, and how can we help you now being a student athlete transition all of that to when you graduate? Uh, so it was a really amazing program. Um, I was part of it for four years, but what I really loved about it was that it helped me kind of focus on what my professional goals, goals would be um, in terms of resume building, in terms of LinkedIn, and how do we can utilize our strengths being an athlete um, to then become professionals in whatever it is that we want to become professionals in. So uh, it really, it was a really empowering program. And yeah, I was really glad, glad I was part of it. Awesome, yeah. we'll move to Angela. Um, what prompted your interest in the sports industry in the first place? I, I think just like a lot of people, just a passion. You know, our family were big sports fans, and um, I, we had season tickets to the Padres. And when I was 14, John Morris had bought the team so long ago, but I had walked up to his daughter and just was like Miss Bossy and said, hey, I can, you know, help show you around the stadium and help you with what you want to do. So we were there all the time and she's like, great, you know, can you get down here for games? Can you drive? And I was like, I'll be here every day. But I was 14 and she didn't know that I didn't drive, let alone was it legal <laughs> enough to work. And that summer recognized that you could be a female in sports. And ever since then, I was like, wow, I can get paid to do this and not just play and be a fan. And since then, it has been just an unwavering road. Um, and I've done whatever I've needed to do to make sure that I've done it honestly. Um, and hard work and making sure, again, that I've taken care of the people who've taken care of me along the way. Absolutely, and you've credited former SDSU head basketball, men's basketball coach Steve Fisher and other male champions with um, your rise into the sports industry, but now you're guiding an all-female yes. staff. For someone who wants to work in the sports industry, where should she start? Sure, I think I'd like to address Coach Fisher if that's real quick. You know, he, he single-handedly changed the trajectory of my career. 
1999 when he came here, I was left over from the old team and Coach Fisher did not want anything to do with a female around. And he flat out sat me down in the office and said, I can't hire a girl. Like, could you imagine hearing that? <laughs> and I was begging him. I said, Coach, I said, I'm not here to date the players. I said, I want to, I'm not even kidding. I said, I want to make this my career. Please, please, please give me a chance. And he hemmed and he hawed. Coach Dutcher went to bat for me, some of the other assistants at the time said, you know, she's the only one left over. She knows what's going on. Give her a shot. He took me on one road trip. And from then on, I was, I was the first manager he ever recognized on senior night. He was at my wedding recently. I mean, he's just been somebody who believed in me. And he could have said no, and that could have changed everything. And so I want to give him credit every, every day, every chance I can. Um, but during that experience, I learned that women, just to Kathy's point, weren't given opportunities. And so I made a commitment that I was going, once I knew I was going to be in a position to give back, I was going to hire women and only women. And I, I am shameless about it. I make sure that every time clients are on a big Zoom call and they see my you know, strong team of women, I highlight it. I'm proud of it. And I think that every opportunity that I can, whether it's helping a student athlete or helping a, you know, just students navigating you know, I'm here for it. I'm actually currently on maternity leave. I have my four-week-old over there with my sister. But it's so important to me to help women in their careers that I'm happy to be here. And I just want you all to know that you have an advocate in me. And as a woman and the president of a sports marketing business, do you face any challenges that men may not face? in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and not so much anymore. I think early on I, I experienced ageism because I started so young. So if you think about it, I was 14 with the Padres, and then by the time I moved throughout sports here in San Diego, I was the vice president of our Hall of Champions and Sports Commission at the age of 29. The first female, the youngest person, so I was up against the patriarchy who didn't think I had any business there, even though I had 15 years under my belt. Um, so ageism was a big part of me coming up. And then just, you know, the, the, the personal side, having to draw those boundaries that you see a lot of headlines that, you know, people were getting away with crazy things back in my non-social media days. Um, so having to really just fight through the fact that I wasn't there to date the players. You know, I would travel with the San Diego State team and they'd go, are you the cheerleader? Or I would deposit my checks from the Chargers and they're like, are you one of the girlfriends? You know, and I'm like, why can't I just work? Um, I forget where we're going with that. Again, I'm on no sleep with this baby. But, you know, <laughs> Facing um, challenges that challenges, men made. Yeah. yeah, and now, you know, now, again, because I had that epiphany that I do know what I'm talking about. I'm not, you know, young and cute like I used to be. Like, I don't have those problems, so it's just a lot different now. But I make sure that I empower the women that I hire around me to, to, to have their voice and to back them up and to not be mansplained on things when a lot of the times, you know, you, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that absolutely Pardon sums me. it up, yeah. and it sounds like you're bringing a lot of seats to the table yeah. for other women looking to enter yeah. the industry. Thank you. Um, Kathy, so we touched on this a little bit already with the Title IX um, discussion. Do you think Title IX adequately addresses inequities in women's college athletic programs currently? Um, as is true of every law, we find ways around certain things. Right. So yes and no. Um, you know, Title IX allows for three prongs uh, for athletics departments to um, uh, look at themselves as, a, you know, in, in compliance via three prongs, but those three prongs don't always really match dollars spent. So for example, uh, San Diego State has approximately 55% female enrollment. So in the athletics department at San Diego State, you should find approximately 55% female participants and um, scholarships for those women. So those are some of the prongs used, but it, that in and of itself doesn't touch the amount of money that is spent on male versus female student athletes. Now, San Diego State is one of the best in the country in terms of Title IX and matching um, the opportunities and the, the uh, equipment and the, because we are all housed in one building. We use the same equipment room. We use the same weight room. We use, have the same um, support services, academic support services and so on. So we're one of the best, um, but many, many uh, universities 
high schools throughout the nation don't pay attention to those things. And then they allow outside booster organizations to come in and spend more money on the football team or the basketball team. And then that's not, that's not added into the equation. So as with any law, we find ways around it. And until somebody stands up and says, hey, wait, this is wrong. We don't address the problem. Now, where I've seen the improvement is that more and more people are willing to say, hey, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And are not afraid of what's going to happen to them if they do. And that was what has taken us so long, why we're 50 years and we still haven't gotten there. People were afraid mm -hmm. to you know, have those, create waves. Um, now it's not so big of, a, of an issue anymore. Uh, it, it's still going to be a long road. We saw two years ago, I believe it was in the NCAA Women's Basketball Championship, the big uproar about the men stayed in this hotel and they had these facilities available and they had got these gifts and blah, blah, and the women's NCAA basketball teams got nothing in comparison. You know, the fact that we even have to pay attention to those things anymore is crazy. Uh, they, somebody needs to be making sure that's happening without the athlete tweeting about it. So, <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> right, and I think while we have come a very long way, there's still a lot of advocating to be done. So make sure that you advocate it for as much as you possibly can. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. And then Audra will close it out with you before we move into questions from our attendees. How has leadership and equity evolved in women's sports between your time as a college athlete and now as your career as a college coach? Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that I am actually, you know, a head coach and have been a head coach now for eight years in itself is showing there is some growth and we're working towards a more equitable um, experience for athletes and coaches. But I mean, you know, as our other panelists have said, there's, there's a long way to go. I think, um, you know, I, I coached high school for 15 years. I'm now at the junior college level at San Diego City College. And, and we see it as athletes, as coaches, you see the, the male teams getting treated one way and the female teams getting treated another way. You see so many male head coaches being hired to coach female teams when there are many, many, many countless, you know, capable female coaches. Um, so yeah, I think that there's been, there's been growth, but we do have a long way to go. I think that um, you do have to kind of put your name out there and just give it a shot because sometimes I think as women, even if we're not cognizant of it, we, we do kind of limit ourselves for whatever reason, because historically that's always been what it was, especially as, you know, women of color or, um, minorities. It's like, can I, can I really do that? Are they going to really consider me? And, and they, they, they should, you know, and I think the only way that they will, and they'll be able to those, if you put your name out there and if you apply for the job and if you, sometimes you kind of have to fake it till you make it, even if you're not confident, um, you got to just put yourselves in those rooms, put yourselves in those conversations, and then you just leave it up to the powers that be, you know, and I think that I'm a prime example of someone who really came from, from nothing. And now I'm able to, to lead junior college athletes. And I think that um, hopefully with they see people like all of us in these roles, then, then the young women that we're able to influence will take a shot at it too. And I think that's the only way that we'll really ever achieve true equity um, is by just taking those risks and trying to you know, advocate for, for those coming after us. Absolutely. Thank you all for those very thoughtful and honest answers. We're going to open it up to questions from some of our attendees. So if you have a question similar to the keynote, you can come up to the two front microphones and you can um, ask the group or you can ask one of the speakers individually. Is uh, for Angela. And uh, I know you mentioned uh, dealing with ageism in the workplace and uh, dealing with chauvinism in the workplace. What was one of the worst things that you had to deal with and how did you handle it? Mm. And also how did your family, uh, your upbringing play a role in how you mm. handled that? That's a really good question. Um, I'll start with my family. You know, my mom used to make me wear business suits when I worked for the San Diego State basketball team and I hated it. I was 19, I hated suits. <laughs> but she said, you know, you're the only woman on that court and that you're going to stand out. And so she made sure I made wear my suit. So I say that because my mom taught me how to behave like a woman 
but my dad taught me how to be treated like one. So I recognized who my male champions were. I recognized when that wasn't a fit and made sure to kind of navigate my career on that. So I'll be quick with the story on the worst part of my experience in this whole career. Um, I was working for the Chargers at the time and because of my experience at San Diego State in the locker room, I was able to be the first female um, who worked in their PR department to be in the visiting team locker room after the games doing all the interviews and getting quotes to the team and all of that. And the PR director at the time had called Coach Fisher and said, okay, what, you know, can we trust her? Yes. Wanted to know how my decorum would be inside situations like that. And obviously they, they had no problems. So fast forward a couple of seasons, the Chargers were playing a huge AFC rival and a huge, huge name player would stand there and put his towel over his shoulder and have nothing on knowing that I had to sit and hold the recorder while he was getting interviewed. And the PR director hated, the, the visiting team PR director hated that I was allowed in that locker room and emailed my boss and said that I was checking him out. I, I mean, it makes my blood boil sitting here talking about it and this was 17, not 17 years ago, gosh, like 11 years ago. But I, I got called into my boss's office the next morning and he said, look, Angela, this is what the director of this team is saying. I was horrified. I was horrified hearing those words. I was horrified that how dare this man tell me that that's what I was doing after I had just spent seven years in locker rooms and making sure that I'd stare at the ceiling or stare at the floor and do anything I could not have to be in there unless it was work related. And I, I started crying, which was embarrassing for me, but I said, absolutely not. And he goes, I know. He goes, I had to bring it up. This is what's happening. You know, I, I, know, I know how you behave, I'll handle it. And to his credit, to my boss's credit, he told him, she's part of our team. I'm not sure that that's what happened. She's not gonna, you know, she's gonna stay in the locker room. And so I loved it because they were an AFC rival. I had to see him the next 10 seasons and just stand there with my happy self in that locker room knowing that he tried to accuse me of something that was flat out false and he did not win because I had a male champion in there who spoke up for me and who trusted who I was. And that all stems back to how I was raised and how my family brought me up. <laughs> Makes me mad still. <laughs> All right, and then we'll go to this microphone over here. Um, so I had a question for Kathy Cooper. I was just kind of wondering how you got started with Girls Inc. and how it was kind of just doing that from the ground up, um, just being a female and starting a business in that aspect. Yeah, so Girls Inc. is a, actually a national organization. So I did start it, but I wish I did. That would be so great. <laughs> uh, but I was really interested. I knew I wanted to work with girls and I knew I wanted to work with teens. Um, so I started looking out, I believe it was my sophomore year in college. I started really kind of seeing what organizations and nonprofits were around San Diego that I could be in a part of, either volunteering or interning for. Um, that's how I found Girls Inc. So I actually ended up using um, Essex Going Pro and LinkedIn. Um, but I contacted Girls Inc. through LinkedIn and I was like, hey, listen, I'm really passionate about your mission. Um, I definitely want to be a part of your organization. How can I help? And, you know, I reached out and they didn't answer at first, but after a couple of months they did. And that's how I got the internship. So uh, I got an intern for them for about six months as a program and research intern. And then they hired me as a facilitator and now a coordinator. So. Uh, it's, it's an amazing nonprofit. Um, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is essentially teaching about self-confidence and leadership and just teaching girls how they can themselves be confident in themselves and like take their goals and turn that into their dreams and reality. But just kind of like making sure that their voices are heard, that, there's, that the, that's what they want to do um, is achievable and just like making sure that they have those goals for themselves. So that's essentially like what I do on a day to day though. Thank you. You're <laughs> Hi, uh, this is a question for all of you. Uh, what advice would you give young women uh, to like fight and advocate for women in sport? Um, I think just to, you know, use your voice and while social media is a double-edged sword, I think that there is a great opportunity for um, access on social media. So if you feel like there's an issue and you want to be heard, like put it out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, gather your people, get your community together and just 
be vocal about the issues that um, kind of set your soul on fire. So whatever it is, it might be athletics, it might be education, it might be something else. But if you feel passionate about something, guaranteed there are many, many, many other people that also do. And maybe they just don't feel like they have a platform just yet. So it doesn't even have to be people in your area. You can use social media, you can use um, you know, just different avenues to gain that support and get, get a group together and then just fight, you know, relentlessly fight because it, it might be hard, but it will be worth it. And especially if it's something that you care deeply about. And, and you will be criticized. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to just <laughs> yes. go in knowing that. Yes. But if you're not being criticized, you're not getting anything yeah. done. Yeah. So yeah, use your voice. Mm -hmm. it, we need more people who are willing to and are not afraid. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so as so I'm personally a marketing major, and for a really long time, I wanted to potentially delve into working into sports or working in sports. But I found a little bit of difficulty knowing that, especially the entry level positions, and like for the first couple of years working in sports, um, it's sort of like a passion project at that point where they don't really pay you all that much. Uh, so how? And I don't know, you know, if this is the same experience for everyone. Um, how did you guys deal with uh, potentially receiving a lower pay in, mm -hmm. in, you know, knowing that you're doing something that's passionate? How did you keep morale up so that you could stay in that sort of industry? We can all probably yeah. speak to that. <laughs> I, know. I could, I, you know, I could say again, I, I knew where I was going, but there was, you know, I was a grown adult and having to do what I could to make my business work. So that meant renting out my extra bedroom to exchange students, having to run home, to cook meals for them. Um, you know, I called it broke management, having to, uh, you know, I would do taste test, tests at Jack in the Box for $60 cash, so I had gas money to go to LA to meet with an agent. And this was me in my early 30s, you know, when, I, when all my friends were established. So if it's on your heart, you're gonna do whatever it takes. Like money, I have never once made a career decision, made any decisions based on money, particularly a career decision. Thank you. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, uh, just it, you call it's me got down. to be your passion. <laughs> yeah. It has to be your passion. Yeah. I haven't been out of the house in four weeks, so I'm like, all yeah. work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I do think, like, to speak to low, low paying careers, that's definitely something that, that many people face. And if, it, if it's on your heart, mm -hmm. you're going to find a way to make it work. And yeah. I think that hustle is your best friend. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, still, I have, I have several different lines of income. Right. And so just you can be focused in the one thing that you love, mm -hmm. but, you know, be open to hustling and to and to figuring it out. And if you want to help people, there's other ways to help people, too. You know, so just making sure that you're willing to work like a work ethic goes a very, 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 very long way in today's world. And, and just, you know, stick to itness is what I call it. You just got to stick to it, work hard, put your head down and, you know, it, it'll it'll come about. But I don't think any of us are up here trying to make a million dollars or be you know, wealthy because of this, like we're trying to change lives. And if that's the case, then then it'll come when, when it's your time. Hi, um, my name is Mary Posse. I'm a, a owner of a small youth basketball program down in South Bay. And this question's for Audra and Kathy. So as a basketball coach um, and a young one and a female one, mm -hmm. I struggled with confidence and I still do. And I was wondering if there was a moment in time where you realized, oh, I do know what I'm talking about. I can do this. Uh, Kathy, go for it. <laughs> Which Kathy? Young or old? <laughs> uh, you guys are both beautiful and both young. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I don't know there's a, there, there's a time that it clicks in. I think you know you, what you believe. I think you have to, your core, your morals, your values, your ethics, your, you know, you, you, know what you believe in and you know it's a righteous cause and you go and you teach that. Um, and just the fact that you're willing to walk up there and stand in front of that mic and ask that question tells me you have it. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's what we do. And don't be afraid of it. It's good. Embrace it. Yeah. I think that um, as a coach, coaching with integrity is so much mm -hmm. of everything and coaching um, the way, you know, that that you maybe wanted to be coached, or if you have children, like if you're coaching the way you'd want your children to be coached, I have a, a teenage daughter as well. And, you know, I, I reflect on it a lot. And I still don't know if I've made it to the point where, you know, 
I know what I'm doing, but I'm still trying. And I yeah. think that I think that you do have to be um, mindful about considering feedback. So I think mm -hmm. that there's always going to be naysayers and stuff like that. But if the majority of people, if your kids are coming back, if you see smiles on their faces, if you see those little wins in the gym, then you know you know that what you're doing is right. You know, and if people are in the gym then you're doing something right. Because there's lots of other gyms and lots of other programs that they could be at. Yeah. So I think just being, um, you know, have faith that if there's people there, then, then you're definitely on the right track. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh. All right, and then we have time for one more question. Go ahead. Okay, great. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, hi, I'm Victoria Gonzalez. I'm here with Home Start Maternity Shelter. Um, I am a youth advocate and a youth counselor and peer counselor. So my question is, I also graduated from San Diego City College with a degree in social work. Um, I also went to SDSU in 2009 and 2010 as well as a social work major. Um, I'm 30 years old and I constantly work with women who are either in transitional housing or going from point A to point B and just now establishing themselves. Um, me, as 30 years old, I'm just now figuring out what I wanna do with my life. Um, I'm starting a notary business um, to become a legal notary. I take my final exam next week. Um, but for so many years, the same thing comes up as for women who always have the same question when they're struggling to find what they want to do in their life because they feel like they started off so late mm -hmm. and they figured it out so late um, with children and trying to get educated and things of that nature. And it's so cliche, I feel like, to keep telling them, oh, you just have to keep pushing, just keep pushing, just keep pushing, because you keep pushing and sometimes, I'm, I'm sure you all know, like you take one step forward and you get knocked five steps back. Um, and especially with these women, when it comes to not having the resources available to them that they need um, when they turn a certain age. So what would you say besides keep pushing to the women who are just now figuring out what they wanna do with their life? Anyone. Even if it's only one year that you do it, you know, mm -hmm. be passionate about it. And you, it's, it's about who you touch. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, the influences that you have in that one year. Um, and trust me, 30, 40 is very young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you all are very young. <laughs> um, you, you have a long time to have that influence. Um, and whether you start going to college at 40 years old or 80 mm -hmm. years old or 20 years old, it, it's it's learning and having that influence on others mm -hmm. and, and living mm -hmm. a good life. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I know you had said something about having a child mm -hmm. and yeah. trying to, you know, being, you know, uh, dealing with the ageism and things yeah. of that nature. So yeah, on the personal side, you know, I think, um, I, I've been through it all. Like I've lost boyfriends because of my industry. I've had friends burn me and use me. You know, um, I spent a lot of weekends and holidays away and you know, I, I had a lot of hard lessons to learn. But I never, um, on the, when, I, when it came to having a family, I was never gonna just settle like it was important to me to get my career going and that's, what was, that's where I wanted to be. Knowing that things would just figure itself out or you know, wherever I ended up. But having kids, I've had kids later so I have a three and a, a four week, a three year old and a four week old, but got married late, had kids late, but there's no way I would be the mom and wife I am today if I didn't establish and work my butt off for 20 years, 25 years. And I don't regret any of it. You know, I, I had, you know, I'm an advanced maternal age during my pregnancy is what I'm considered, mm -hmm. but that it, it didn't matter because now I can take maternity leave like peacefully. I never, 10 years ago, I would have been a nervous wreck feeling like I was missing out and I should be everywhere, even though I'm sitting here right now. But you know what I mean? Like, I just wouldn't have just, I wouldn't, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I just, I was where I needed to be and I didn't put pressure on myself to have children at any certain time until I was ready. Oh, thank you very much. Well, that wraps up our Women in Athletics panel. Thank you all again for your thoughtful answers. Um, and all your honesty with some of these tough questions. Um, we really appreciate you for joining us today and thank you all for attending as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.